Back in college, I saw the movie Whiplash, and I really loved it. You know, I, it was it was an exciting, energetic movie, and it spoke to anyone with any creative aspirations because it kind of has this theme of it's worth the pain and the suffering to express yourself, and uh, the, the obstacles we face, good or bad, will come to define us and come to uh, inspire us. And life went on, and then I saw La La Land, also by Damien Chazelle. And, you know, given my taste in movies, you might not expect me to love La La Land, but I did, and I still do. I think it's a, just a really refreshing, fun, classic Hollywood movie. Uh, I think there's a bit of an irony casting Ryan uh, Gosling and Emma Stone, who are two of the biggest A-list celebrities in the world, to tell the story of, like, you know, you can make it if you if you dream. And because, uh, you, you know, it, I think the movie would have been even more effective if it was two no names or two just like amateur actors, uh, not amateur in the like bad sense, I guess, but in the sense that people we haven't seen before because we're just watching A-list celebrities pretend to be something they aren't. And, uh, but with that said, I do get caught up in the magic and it also once again has this theme of it's worth it. The sacrifices... The, the hardships are worth it because if you try your best and you, and you fucking come at your obstacles full, full force, you can and will make it. And maybe it's a little naive, but it, it, it's a nice thought. And the movie has a lot of really beautiful scenes and sequences. And um, then he made First Man, which is the one that stuck with me the least, as I think it is for everyone. But once again, same theme, same idea of, of it's worth it. It's worth it to make it to the moon. You know, he, he missed time with his family and his daughter and holds the pendant and drops it on the moon or something or other. But uh, it's worth it. They, they did it, all the hardship. He, he powered through and did something amazing. And this is a theme that runs through the through thick in the blood of Damien Chazelle's work. It's it's a kind of start to finish what he's always been about. This sort of passionate, naive optimism, uh, undercut with some realism. You know, he he does have a very realist approach that the world is gonna shit on you and people will be cruel to you and you will you will have things shot down. But he has this sort of belief that it's worth it. And along comes Babylon. And Babylon is an interesting movie. Uh, when it comes to award seasons movies, I'm usually pretty you take or leave it with most of them. They don't really leave me with much. Uh, I loved The Fablemans this year. If we're talking about movies I genuinely loved, I really felt like that was probably one of, if not my favorite Spielberg movies. It felt like such a passion project that he actually needed to make. And it just, it talked to me on a level that I wasn't expecting. But uh, Babylon, of all the movies, I think warrants discussion. And for better or worse, I think that's a good quality for a movie to have. Because I saw, you know, I saw The Whale, Puss in Boots, which isn't really an award season. Maybe it's up for Best Animated. I don't know. I didn't see the nominations. But, uh, you know, I saw a bunch of movies when I was home for Christmas. And most of them, take or leave, but uh, Babylon has stuck with me, at least thematically, and it interests me. Because it's this big bloated movie, $80 million or something, so expensive. And it's very self-indulgent, perhaps. It's three hours long, and the plot kind of repeats itself. And it's like, geez Louise, we've seen this story before of the silent film star f f having a fall from grace at, at the advent of talkies. You know, it's a story that... If you go to film history class or you watch any number of movies, this story has been treaded over and over again. And perhaps this one sets itself apart by being a little more brutal and realistic and modern. You know, it doesn't hold back. I, I, I've heard people say the partying and the, the graphic content feels a little vanilla. It feels like, oh, this is the shocking stuff that, like, it's just expected. It's like somebody pees on somebody and there's, a, there's an underground sex dungeon. It feels like a little like shocking, but shocking in an expected way. I don't know, I, I kind of agree with that, but at the very least it's showing like a seedy underbelly to to this this uh, golden era of Hollywood. And um, 
Yeah, but what interests me is that he's, he stages the movie at the start in the silent film era and pre presents it with a lot of love and care. You know, he really seems to have a reverence for the lawlessness of the 1920s, you know, before talkies and all this. There, there's a genuine, uh, as I put it, uh, I have a letterbox and I write reviews and I feel corny quoting my reviews, but it, it, they sum up my thoughts. So I guess it's just my thoughts, but uh, the way I put it is, uh, is like, if, if you get killed in a lion's den, you knew what you were in, in for, versus if you get mauled to death in a cat cafe, perhaps <laughs> they should have been more honest about having lions there, you know? It's, it's kind of, that's kind of the dichotomy he plays with, because, yeah, the, it, it was a lawless, horrible place where people died and this and that, but, like, they knew what they were in for because it was presented that way, versus what followed, which is this very barbaric, undertone to like people you know having these like very prim and proper parties and this and that but people were still being disrespected and discarded and ignored and in a very quiet passive way and it, it feels a bit more uh dishonest i think is kind of the heart of what he was getting at and and uh you know the the movie going into spoilers i usually will just talk about movies broadly but i'll get a little more specific and that's um as it goes on you see margot and these other characters their lives fall apart uh brad pitt's the star that has a fall from grace and this and that and the the general theme of the movie is kind of like his other movies in that they're facing these obstacles life is shitting on them despite how hard they tried and how hard they dreamed and and the difference with this one is i don't know if it's worth it and i don't know if he knows if it's worth it it seems to be hypercritical of Hollywood. And, you know, it's, it's easy to look at it simply as a period piece and say like, man, they were mean to people in the 20s and 30s. Man, they really stomped on people's dreams and, and, and brutalized them and, and like uh, the, the drugs and the debt and this and that. Uh, it, it really, it's easy to look at it in ju as just a product of its time, but I do think the ending, which we are treated to a montage of the main character watching the, uh, a movie singing in the rain, and then it plays a montage of movie history. You see all the advents of technology in this. So it makes it not just about the transition to talkies, but the transition to, you know, color and special effects and uh, video and, um, and computer effects and this and that it goes all the way you see you have a clip of avatar and i was like what's going on you know it was a very uh my friend dax put it as it was a coked out idea it seemed like the, the damien was maybe doing a little bit too much coke and he's like this that this that and um and then movies we see all of movies and we contextualize it as all of film history and um i think what that does for the film is it makes you consider that all of film history is built on the backs of people who suffered, people who didn't make it, people who didn't get their chance to shine, people who had their chance to shine and lost it and faded away. You know, the, in the movie they say the stars burn the brightest and the cockroaches merely survive. And uh, all of film history is built on the back of stars and cockroaches. And uh, it, it really makes it about not just the time period it's set in, but all of film history this ending. And, arguably the question comes to is it worth it and yet the movie ends with the main character smiling and crying and just a, a, a smile of joy perhaps or a smile of accepting that it was worth it for movies to happen and uh i don't know i don't know if this one convinced me you know i was i'm convinced that maybe uh miles teller you know earned being like being a professional great drummer despite the abuse he went through. I, I believe that their love dissolving in La La Land was worth where they got. You know, I believe the naive optimism of his other movies. But this one, somebody said it on that letterbox, they said, is it a love letter to Hollywood or a suicide note? Is it saying like movies are horrible and they treat people horribly and for every star there's a thousand people who are just never known and they aren't one of the anointed ones. And I, I don't know if that's the point it's making because he smiles at the end. And I don't know what that smile means. I don't know if it's telling us it is worth it. It's worth the pain and the suffering and the loss. 
and the crushing and the defeat. It's, I, don't, I don't know if that's what it's telling us. Uh, if he didn't smile, it would be more, more obvious. And that maybe this is why the movie's interesting to me because it makes me think. I don't, I think it was bloated. I think it, uh, it was some of its uh, storylines and points are a bit tired, but it at least made me consider that. And I think Damien Chazelle might think it is worth it, you know, because he's making movies. And the irony is he has to think it's worth it because he just made an $80, $80, $80 dollar movie with movie stars and bloated budgets and this and that. And it bombed at the box office. So it, it kind of became poetic in and of itself that it's this giant star picture that it is perhaps not performing as well and perhaps calling into question its own messages but he has to think it's worth it to operate in that system because the movie makes the movie about modern hollywood it makes it about how cruel and unforgiving we could be to people's dreams and how undelicate we are with people who are hurt and struggling and uh he has to believe it's worth it or else why make a movie that's that expensive within that cold system of hollywood so because if he doesn't think it's worth it, <laughs> he, it has to be a suicide note. It has to be like him dropping out of movies forever. And I don't think he's going to do that either. So uh, I, I don't know what to think of the movie. Um, it had some great sequences. He always nails that energy in his editing. You know, when it's cross-cutting between multiple scenes and building and building. Like that is always enthralling. Uh, I just don't know what the movie's really saying. It, 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 and a good movie opens up a discussion, and it's two sides of a good argument. That's what uh, Michael Sarah says in his Criterion Closet picks, which is one of my favorite videos. And uh, he's quoting somebody else. But uh, yeah, I, it, it was an interesting movie that warranted thought, and that's more than I can say about a lot of movies uh, nowadays. Um, but I, I'm curious what he makes next because it, it's a very definitive sort of point in his career where he has this this box office bomb where he got a blank check and he kind of he kind of blew it or he didn't know what to do with it maybe I don't know but uh, I'm he's a director I enjoy I I, I love I, I love his first two movies and I I, I admire his next two. So uh, that, that's a pretty good track record for me. And yeah, nah, just some thoughts on Babylon. I, I, I hope you guys uh, enjoyed them. And I hope you, if you saw the movie, you enjoyed it. Or at least got your mind thinking. And uh, yeah, I love you guys. And I love movies. I hope you're having a nice day. Bye-bye.